Welcome to the future. Bringing you the latest in science and technology from around Russia. We've got the future covered. Hi, right, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to turn to economist John Matonis. He's a former CEO of Hushmail. He's a former chief forex trader at Visa. He's also a blogger at Monetary Future. He's been writing about Bitcoin lately. So we're going to talk to him about Bitcoin. John Matonis, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Good to be here. All right. So what is Bitcoin? Well, to start off uh, on initially how I got interested in this, I I'd like to just take a step back and say that um, as a society, I think that I, I believe that we can do better than centralized monetary planning and debasing the currency as the central banksters have been doing. Okay, that's a recurring theme on this show. Exactly. This is why we really want to dig into this Bitcoin story. It's getting a lot of press lately, so take us through what, what's going on here. Okay, the very, at the very basic level, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed electronic currency. When you say P2P or peer-to-peer, -peer, I think of music file swapping. And there's computers and they have music on the computers and the computers are able to swap files of music P2P in this way and fa made famous from Napster. You know, Napster was a very f became very famous. And, and BitTorrents. And BitTorrents. BitTorrents for movies. Okay, um, so you're, now this is being applied to currencies, it's, right? Now but, it's being applied to currencies. So you can think of it as BitTorrents for movies applied to currencies. You can also think of it as PGP encrypted email. PGP for money is another way to think of it. People know about pretty good privacy for email. Right, PGP is an encryption technology that, that's readily available. Uh, readily available now, it wasn't at first, but now you can have end-to-end -end secure email. All right, so take us, take us through a transaction. So a, a normal transaction using Bitcoin on the web. Uh, so how, how would I, as a consumer, uh, how, do I, how do I interact with it? Well, as a consumer, you would initially download the Bitcoin client, and you would do that from Bitcoin.org. It's open source software, and the currency is not centrally managed. Um, it's, not the, it's not centrally issued, and the transactions aren't centrally verified. All of those tasks are performed by the collective nodes of the network. So it, um, it, it's almost like a, uh, a headless mob where there is no central direction. And, and that's beneficial. That's what you want. The, the main thing... Okay, so I download the client on the bit, uh, bitcoin.org, which, which now I am part of the network. So now you've downloaded the client. You have the option either to generate coins or to perform transactions, okay, to receive, and send. So you, I can either generate coins or I can be involved in a transaction using these coins, correct? Correct. Okay, so let's, let's put aside generating the coin for a second because there is some jargon there we're going to revisit. But so let's just talk about a transaction, though. The transaction side, how does that work? The way the transaction works is you would either have to receive or send coins. So let's assume that you already have some coins okay. and that you either purchased them or, or they were sent to you. Uh, what you've done when you've downloaded the client is you've generated your own public-private key pair. So you're able to sign your coins, and then you have a public key, like you would for PGP, that you put out for receiving your coins. Okay, so I purchase these Bitcoins. So if I can purchase them with my dollars, my U.S. dollars. Correct. So, and there, I presumably there's some kind of exchange rate. The exchange rate currently is, is around six or seven U.S. dollars for and, one Bitcoin. And that's floating, I would imagine. It's, it's 24 hours a day. It's, it's floating rate. Right. So it's a floating rate depending on variable. On supply and demand. Just like the, any Forex, just like any currency, there, it's, uh, it's floating on the exchange based on supply and demand. Exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, overall, though, I do think the exchangers are one of the weakest links in the chain just because that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of converting these uh, so-called math puzzles okay, into so actual national political currencies. Okay, so that you're saying the exchange mechanism is not, is not as robust as it could be because, because of the puzzles that go into creating the exchange rate mechanism. Well, uh, I mean, the math puzzle is just a, a, um, uh, it's just a slang term that I use for the digital token. It, you have to remember, it's a digital bearer token that I'm sending you. So it's like if I were to scrunch up a, a casino chip or a $100 bill and shoot it through the broadband connection, it would shoot out your internet here and you would have represent you would have the value. When you lose bitcoins, they're destroyed. You can't get them back. 
Um, and just like when you burn a dollar bill, that hundred dollar bill is gone from the system. So that's what makes these so unique and different is that it's not just a counterparty trade like with PayPal, it's a digital bearer token that you can actually send to someone over the internet. And we haven't had that before on the internet, which is a lot of what a lot of people miss in this. Right, a digital bearer coupon. Or so a digital bearer certificate. Right, so like a bearer certificate, like a bearer bond, is how we most frequently see that term. It's, uh, it's not made out to anyone specifically. It's, it's its own, like a dollar, is not, doesn't have my name on it. Correct. Okay. It, it, it exists because right. of the generation that you went through on the cryptographic side. But PayPal is, it has more, it is bearer in the sense that I'm using two named email participants and they're making a cross. Not only is it bearer, but it is um, subject to reversibility. And uh, PayPal has up to 60 days when they can reverse transactions. Right. With, with Bitcoin, uh, you have 100% tr transaction irreversibility. So it really is like cash on the internet. Okay, so it's anonymous in the way that dollars should be. However, since the, the non-digital economy is becoming more dominated by electronic payment systems that are tied to databases and being identified constantly, in fact, those transactions are not really as anonymous as people think or would hope that they would be. Whereas a Bitcoin electronic transaction, peer-to-peer, -peer, bearer note, Decentralized. Decentralized is, in fact, anonymous. Absolutely. It has the potential to be anonymous. Now, it's, it's all how you structure it. It's not 100% anonymous for the people who don't know how to use it and structure it right, because you can always look at the blockchain and the transactions that have happened. You might not be able to associate those to the people, but if you're careful in how you use Bitcoin, it can, you can make it anonymous for yourself. Okay, so it's, it's decentralized, and what you're describing in this P2P network is a community that is almost self-regulating. And it's in their interest to make sure that every piece of the transaction is running smoothly. Similar, I guess you could say, to what we see in the open source movement with software projects like Linux, where the community is contributing code to the Linux operating system in their own self-interest. And there's no reason not to contribute the best you could to that system because you yourself you you yourself use that system. Precisely, so. precisely. They're, they're coming out with, with new releases, uh, so it's updated, the code is updated, and you can download the newest version if, if you'd like to. Yeah. Um, I, I think with everything that you're mentioning though, Max, it has so many, uh, so many things that are revolutionary, but let's look in the economic side of how this will affect things. I mean, if, if, if it's possible to have tax-free exchanges, you could potentially get, uh, th this would assist in, in almost a parallel economy that would exist alongside of a regular economy that wouldn't be counted in GDP. Uh, peop uh, people, um, people would be doing tax-free transactions and, and as long as they were able to spend the Bitcoin within the Bitcoin ecosystem, they would be living as sovereign individuals. Now, on the government level, I think what this is going to actually lead to is a move and a shift away from the model of taxing income. And I think you're going to start to see governments move towards some type, type of consumption-based tax or headcount type tax. And the reason is because the income levels uh, of individuals are going to be more and more difficult to ascertain. Right. So it's similar in a way to barter. In that you barter, you're bartering out there, and you borrow, you barter a goat for five chickens, let's say, and you're not creating a revenue stream, taxable revenue. Correct. So you're recreated in the digital environment. You you you've created a digital uh, bartering system, if you will. Barter is still taxable, though. I mean, even with barter, you you, you don't really get out of taxation. I, what what I'm stating is that even with Bitcoin, you you would still be liable for the taxes. But I think that what what will happen at the government level is that it'll be difficult to ascertain true income and, and, and governments won't be able to use money to track identity. It wasn't really until the income tax in, in 1916 that governments started using money to, to track identity. Okay, now clearly this is a challenge to the status quo. Clearly, the, uh, the, as you mentioned, the 1960 income tax, which came on the heels of the 1913 creation of the Federal Reserve Bank, Correct. which created interest-bearing uh, money, and w they needed the income tax to pay for the interest, uh, and you ended up, well, a lot of people would argue, uh, close to 100 years of, of a system that got, com gets completely away from having what the founding fathers in the U.S., anyway, had intended. So, but you're taking on the establishment in this way. So, uh, clearly, uh, they're going to feel 
threatened at some point, or do they feel threatened, or is there going to be a confrontation of some sort, or how do you approach that? I don't think that Bitcoin is large enough right now to be on the radar uh, of, of, of many governments. The, the entire economy is, is approximately $50 million. If you take the, the total number of Bitcoins outstanding multiplied by the exchange rate, it's $50 million. And it used to just be $5 million uh, a small time ago. I can see it growing exponentially, and it, it definitely challenges the status quo. But I also think that they're in a quandary, because if they were to uh, uh, prosecute it, or if they were to prohibit it, they would actually be lending legitimacy to it because uh, it, it's it's a, it's an intangible math puzzle. So I, I brought a little prop. Along okay, you're getting me. back to the puzzles now. We're well, just, I, I there's just three things we've talked about, with, and, and what we've got then two things we have yet to fully explain: the puzzles and the coin creation. I don't even think we're going to have time to get into the coin creation bit. We've got to look at that yourself at Bitcoin.org to fill in on that bit. But the puzzles, we're going to conquer the puzzles here. Tell me what you got for the puzzles. Well, the, the, actually, the prop is not for the puzzles. Okay. I use the term puzzle because I'm, I'm trying to get away from the cryptography discussion that's involved in, in, in creating the coins. The prop that I brought, though, okay. is a normal USB thumb drive yes. that you can put things on. Now, I can have $100,000 worth of Bitcoin on here. And I'm talking about challenging what you mentioned about uh, how Bitcoin can challenge the status quo. Um, I can cross the border with this right. going into France or going into Switzerland or going into any country and, and, and have it in my pocket and without having to declare anything. And, and there's currently nothing illegal about that because you have $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, but no, no governments recognize the value of Bitcoin. It's still just math is what I'm saying. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, is there a single point of failure? In yeah. other words, can I knock this out with a, w somehow if I were a government somewhere? Because if it's on the Internet and it's part of the network, and the network, as we know, is there is no single point of failure, then is it indestructible? I believe that it is. And there are certain weaknesses, but I, I, will, I will tell you this. Um, if BitTorrents were destructible, wouldn't the copyright regimes already have shut those down? I, I believe digital cash will do to legal tender what BitTorrents did to copyrights. All right, we're going to leave it there. Uh, that is fascinating, and we will follow up on this. You have dedicated your blogging, Monetary Future, pretty much to the exploration of this, correct? And, and the implications. It's gotten more and more in the, in the Bitcoin direction as this has started to pick up. I want to focus on the exchangers. There's about 2,000 exchangers uh, globally that I want to start to focus on more with the blog. Okay, and that's monetaryfuture.com? Is that the name? Themonetaryfuture.blogspot.com. Okay, themonetaryfuture.blogspot.com. Yes. All right, John uh, Matonis, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. And I want to thank my guest, John Matonis, from themonetaryfuture.blogspot.com. If you want to send me an email, please do so at Kaiser Report at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.